Welcome to my new series on complex analysis, where we explore complex numbers and functions of complex numbers. In our first video, we will introduce the complex numbers and investigate the rotational properties of the imaginary number i. I'm also going to begin introducing some visualization tools that will help us explore complex functions. I think it will be quite helpful to become familiar with these visualizations early in the series, so let's begin. This is a complex number. Unlike your everyday real numbers, it has two components, a real part, 2, and an imaginary part, 3i. It may seem strange at first to invent numbers that are imaginary. However, defining this simple constant i greatly simplifies mathematics. It looks like this is an equation, but it is more correct to think of it as a single complex number with two components. It is a single number in the sense that you can assign it to a variable. For example, z equals 2 plus 3i. There is a tradition to use the letter z as the generic variable when talking about complex numbers. 2 plus 3i could easily be the solution to a simple equation. The real component 2 is just an ordinary number. If the imaginary part was 0i, then the value would simply be 2, a real number. The real numbers are just a small subset of the complex numbers. The imaginary component 3i is the special part. You can think of i as a constant. We use this i notation because it is then possible to mostly use the normal rules of algebra when manipulating equations. There are one or two big exceptions to this rule, but normally you can just do algebra with complex numbers as normal. For example, Addition, 2 plus 3i plus 4 plus 3i. We just do normal algebra, add in the coefficients, and we get 6 plus 6i. I'll cover the visual intuition for addition in the next video. i is defined to be the square root of negative 1. It is always the positive square root. No ordinary number squares to equal negative 1. It is something that was invented. So we say that i is imaginary. The negative square root is negative i. It naturally follows that i squared is equal to negative 1. By squaring, we are just removing the square root sign. Any time that you see i squared in an equation, simply replace it with negative 1. To work with square roots of other negative numbers, we simply take the negative out of the square root as a factor of i. So, the square root of negative 4 becomes i times the square root of 4, which is equal to 2i. If you were to stumble across a square root sign with a negative under it, it is a good idea to take the factor of i out straight away. You are less likely to make calculation errors if you use the i notation. Because the big algebra exceptions I alluded to earlier are the identities that multiply and divide square roots. They only work for positive square roots. When you learnt these at school, your textbook would have included a condition that A and B are positive, but at that time it probably had little meaning. You can't use these identities when manipulating negative or complex numbers. Other than this big exception, the rules of algebra move across to the complex numbers in a pretty intuitive manner. So let's try to visualise some complex numbers. Complex numbers have two components, or two dimensions. There are two parts of the number that can change independently of each other. We could represent them as two number lines. If we represent each value as a spot, you can see that they can move independently on the lines. However, it turns out to be far more useful to place the imaginary numbers on the vertical axis, making a plane. We can then represent a number as a single spot. If we vary the real part of a complex number, our spot moves horizontally. If we vary the imaginary part, our spot moves vertically. This visualization quickly becomes very powerful. 
it is much easier to reason about complex numbers visually. Soon we will start to look at functions of complex numbers, which is a subject known as complex analysis. The number i is located here, on the vertical axis. Negative i is located here below the real axis. i squared, or negative 1, is of course located on the real axis. Now let's start thinking visually. It's very useful to think of i as a 90 degree rotation around the origin. We always measure angles anti-clockwise, starting from the positive real axis. In fact, any number multiplied by i is a 90 degree rotation. For example, 2 becomes 2i. Two plus three i becomes minus three i plus two i. We can verify this algebraically just by multiplying the i through. i times two plus three i becomes two i plus three i squared. Remember that i squared is simply negative one, so we get two i minus three, which is conventionally written minus three plus two i. In fact, you can think of multiplying a number by negative 1 as a 180 degree rotation. Using only real numbers, this is a sign swap. But you can see that thinking of this action as a 180 degree rotation generalizes to complex numbers quite nicely. Multiplying by negative i is a negative 90 degree rotation. Now that you're thinking visually, it's much easier to understand the powers of i. For example, i cubed is just i times i times i. So, it is three 90 degree rotations. Or just negative i. i to the power of four is four 90 degree rotations. So i to the power of four just equals one. Likewise, i to the fifth power equals i. You get the idea. The powers of i dictate the number of 90 degree rotations. Algebraically, this property is not immediately obvious. Let's try the negative powers. 1 over i just equals i to the negative 1, because 1 over any power is the negative of that power. So it is just a negative 90 degree rotation. What about something more complicated like 1 over i cubed? It's just i to the negative 3, or 3 negative 90 degree rotations, so it equals i. Actually resolving a value like 1 over i cubed algebraically might take you a little thinking time, but with some visual intuition, the result becomes much clearer. This is especially true when you see a value like 2 plus 3i over i. As soon as you realise that it is 2 plus 3i and a negative 90 degree rotation, things become clearer. Complex analysis is the subject of mathematics where we study the functions of complex numbers. Imagine a function like y equals x squared. If we allow x to be a complex number, the result y will also be a complex number. Normally complex analysis is taught as a more advanced topic, but in this video series I would like to slowly introduce some ideas in each video. I think it will really help with your visual intuition. On paper, complex functions are hard to graph because the input is two-dimensional and the output is also two-dimensional. But using video it's much easier. We can visualise a function changing over time. Let's take a look at a very simple function. f of z equals iz. This means that every value of z on our plane we multiply by i. It should be a 90 degree rotation. Let's plot many different values of z, a spot for each one. 
Let's apply our function now and see where each ball goes. You can see that each spot is rotated exactly 90 degrees around the origin. You can think of a complex function as a map that takes any point and moves it to another point. This becomes even clearer when we do it with a picture. Instead of spots, let's just use the pixels in an image. Now let's try one more function, f of z equals minus iz. Our image rotates negative 90 degrees. Using images in this way to represent functions is actually quite a powerful idea. When studying complex analysis, we are often trying to visualise four dimensions. Two dimensions for the input and two dimensions for the output. Before I finish this video, I would like to start introducing some visualisation tools that we will use in future videos. Don't worry if you find these difficult to understand at first, because we will investigate them in great detail in later videos. One of the most useful tools we have is phase portraits. These are created both in 2D and 3D. They can be a little tricky to read at first, so I've decided to introduce them very early in the series so you can become familiar with them. This is the phase portrait of the function f of z equals z. The most simple function, the input, is the same as the output. The grid represents the function's input. The colour represents the function's output. We don't show the magnitude of the output, just the angle. In this series we will make red an angle of zero, cyan an angle of 180 degrees, or pi radians. Please keep in mind that not everyone uses the same colour convention. I've chosen this scheme because it represents a direct mapping from the complex angle to the angle of the hue on a colour wheel. Let's change our function to i times z. As expected, it causes a rotation. However, that rotation is not in the same direction as we saw our image rotate earlier. That's because with phase portraits, the location is the input, the colour is the output. So for example, the point z equals 1. The colour is greenish, so we know that the output lies somewhere on the positive imaginary axis. Phase portraits are very powerful in their own right, and as we shall see in later videos, they can reveal a great deal of information about a function. But they do lack magnitude, we lose our sense of scale. We can however add a third dimension to represent the magnitude. Let's use height to express the absolute value of our function. You are looking at the most simple function, f of z equals z. The input is the same as the output. Our graphic covers the region of a radius 2 circle. This function forms a simple cone because we are plotting vertically how far each point is from the origin. For well-behaving functions which we call analytic, these graphics make it easy to identify the important points in our output. For example, zeros always appear as the lowest point. If I multiply our function by i, what do you think will happen? Well, the result is simply rotated by 90 degrees. This doesn't change the height, but our angles change. Looking directly down from the top, you get a traditional 2D phase portrait. Let's try investigating a more complicated function now. This is the graph of cosine of z. In later videos, we will explore this function in detail but I thought it might be fun to give you a taste now. For our shape, I have chosen to graph a rectangle. Plus or minus 2 pi along the real axis, and plus or minus 2 units along the imaginary axis. Looking down the real axis, you can see the normal real function cos of z. Remember, the height is the absolute value. Positive parts are red, and negative parts are cyan. One great advantage of these graphics is that it is easy to identify the zero points. This function only has zero points along the real axis. You will notice a distinct curve shape at minus 2 pi, 0 and 2 pi. This curve on the imaginary axis is cosh of z, that is the hyperbolic cosine of z, which incidentally is the shape a hanging wire forms when hung from two poles. Turned upside down, it is the strongest possible shape for an archway. Let's see if we can graph the function cosh of z directly. Remember that the position on the ground plane of the phase portrait is the input to the function. 
so we need to rotate the input of the cosine function by 90 degrees. So let's try graphing cos of iz. Indeed, the result is exactly the modulus surface of cos z. It seems that the trigonomic functions and hyperbolic functions are directly related when viewed through the eyes of complex numbers. In fact, in one of the remarkable results of mathematics, it is the exponential function e to the z that links these two together. Euler discovered that complex exponentials can be used to build trigonomic functions. This has made solving problems involving waves and phases much easier, which is why we see complex numbers being used extensively in areas like electrical engineering and quantum mechanics. I know that there were some advanced ideas in the last little section, but don't worry if you feel a little lost, we will come back and explore these ideas again soon. I just wanted to give you a little flavour of what is to come. I think it will be helpful to become familiar with our visualisation tools early in this series. For this video, the main takeaway point is that multiplying by i causes a 90 degree rotation around the complex plane. See you in the next video. Please subscribe.